Just be amazing moments, Martin. How did your boys feel when they were there? What do you know? Um, get? Um, yeah, I think it, you know they are quite young. I think they'll probably look back and probably you know see them the significance. Obviously, they you know enjoyed it. It was it was nice. I think uh, meeting the Wigan Warriors mascot, I think it was probably more of a high for them uh, <laughs> uh, than anything. But yeah, they enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I think as they uh, get older and they start to to realise and understand, you know, what their father has achieved, and you know getting to go to, you know, great uh, events like this and like and the statue unveiling and, you know, things that I never, you know, experienced anything like this as a child. But, you know, I think it, it's great for them to, and I love it, you know, for them to be by my side and to experience things that, you know, I, I never experienced, as I say, as a child. No, yeah, amazing for them both. I'm just going to go to my next slide. So with your sporting career, so, I mean, I've got questions here. I'm sure there's people in the audience who will have more, but I really wanted just to kind of go through it in, 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 in some detail. But when I, well, in, in my research on you, as yeah. being someone that I know, um, it wasn't, rugby wasn't your first sport. It wasn't the first sport you took up in a, in a sort of more professional manner, was it? No, um, I suppose at primary school, I was uh, you know, more of just a footballer, wasn't very academic. I uh, was uh, diagnosed as uh, some form of dyslexia, so had a so, so, lot of um, uh, troubles, spelling and, and reading. And so, but, you know, I was very physical and active and loved running, as I say, and football's my... Uh, a sport I played well but when I went to boarding school the age 11 thanks to my brother Parson the 11 plus who came from Nigeria as a seven-year-old couldn't couldn't speak English and still managed to pass his 11 plus but me with my dyslexia unfortunately couldn't pass the entrance exam to Wolves Hall which was a grammar school at the time but fortunately on the sibling rule I got in so thanks Chike for, <laughs> for being <laughs> the smart brainy one in the family and uh, yeah so I played rugby there but um, fencing was the first sport which I really sort of became, you know, quite prominent at, you know, went to fight in France uh, uh, in a big tournament. Uh, I think I was, na I was ranked nationally. I think you can see uh, in this, um, in this picture, I've got sweatbands on my wrist. And a lot of people always ask me, you know, what the story behind them sweatbands. I always, as a rugby player, had a, a red, gold and green one. Uh, the Rastafarian colours and a red, white and blue one on my left hand. And that was due to fencing, which a lot of people oh, okay. don't realise, because um, I used to wear, because you know, fencing is a sport, you know, it's quite intense, you fight indoors, you get quite sweaty, so I used to have the uh, sweatbands to mop my, take my helmet off and mop my brow, uh, but uh, when I fought in France in, in this, uh, got to the final, I, I still to this day can't remember whether I, I, I won or lost, which means I probably lost because uh, if I'd have won, I probably think I would I would more like to remember knowing me. But yeah, the, 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 the guy I fought in the final and uh, this intense battle was a Frenchman. And so uh, he wanted to swap sweatbands with me at the end. I, was, I must have been only about 12 or 13 at the time. And he wanted to swap sweatbands with me. So we swapped sweatbands and that's why um, I ended up having a, a red, gold and green and a red, white and blue sweatband. Ah, okay. No, I wasn't aware. And, and, and so I say, throughout my rugby career, if you see any pictures of me, I think even uh, in my, uh, my, my, my statue, <laughs> bronze, you know, my sweatbands are always depicted in, in throughout my sweatbands rugby Sweatbands immortalised in bronze as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I mean, Martin, there's, there's so, I'm sure there are so many highlights, but can you think back to your career and what, what's been your proudest moments during your sporting career? I think as a sportsman, um, you know, you have many highs, personal um, highs, you know, uh, just things, that, that milestones that I remember. But I do believe that as, as a sportsman, you don't get the, the choice to pick what you're remembered for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whether that's your Eddie the Eagle or whether you are Johnny Wilkinson, you know, John, he's, he's always going to be that uh, that convert that uh, drop goal that he kicked in the 2003 World Cup to you know to secure England um, the, their first win in in a World Cup final and, and bring home uh, the, you know the Web Ellis Trophy. So you know for me it's going to be <laughs> that try I scored at Wembley in 1994, which uh, is going to be um, 
you know, my legacy long after I'm gone. You know, my statue at Wembley is me depicted in the prose that I adopted after scoring that try. You know, though I've scored, you know, 10 tries in a game, I've scored some famous tries at, 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 at Twickenham, you know, at, at uh, you know, in Australia, uh, at Old Trafford, <laughs> at, 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 you know, the Cop End, uh, Anfield. Uh, but yeah, you know, if anyone who's probably ever heard of me or knows anything about me, you know, knows that I scored this this try for Wigan in the um, 1994 Challenge Cup final, uh, which, uh, you know, the picture which you can't quite see on the corner depicted That's me holding the uh, Challenge Cup aloft. And I think that, you know, was a special day for me that day because um, I, I woke up to um, headlines in the Daily Mirror uh, from um, somebody, ironically, who is on the statue with me at Wembley, a guy called Alex Murphy, uh, a great of the game. Uh, who was a, a newspaper columnist at the time and wrote a story that I was finished and I was the best of a bad bunch. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, you know, I woke up to those headlines and, and you know, I have to thank Alex Murphy for those Does that headlines. that spare you one more? <laughs> because it did. Uh, it, when I went to the game, not that a lot of people know, I had in my suit that I, I wore that day, I had that, uh, that headline, you know, that story um, uh, folded up in my breast pocket and, uh, you know, I really did have something to prove because I had... A fantastic year, not know, you know, people know too much about my career, but I was signed uh, from Witness to Wigan in 1992. I moved for a world record fee at the time of 440,000, which was a lot of money. Had a fantastic year in 92, as I say, scored 10 tries in a game, did so much. Came to sort of national prominence, really, as, as, a, as a sporting hero, uh, but didn't have particularly great 93. Went to Australia, dislocated my shoulder, had some very low times and at friend of mine I call Sean Edwards who went on to uh, become a fantastic rugby union coach uh, for Wales and currently now for for France gave me a great bit of advice and said mine if it's not broken don't fix it it's it surged me on to great things and that try that I scored at Wembley in 94 you know I was just was playing you know without fear or, or you know even thought for myself and you know I wasn't the bravest of rugby players I was pretty fast but you know I took the ball in you know under my own sticks and literally ran the length of the field. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, that it, you should always back yourself if you're going to take any lesson from this in life, even when, you know, headlines are in a national paper yeah. saying that you are finished and you are no good, basically. You can still come out and, you know, do something, you know, which yeah. is going to stand the test of time. And now, as I say, there is a statue uh, of me in that pose from that day outside Wembley, our national stadium, you know. Very so ironic. To, to go from those things, you know, and I just, you know, back myself, I had the support of the people that believed in me. You know, this story is no different to stories of people in business, in sport, or in personal life, you know, and, you know, just because it's on the national stage, it, it is no different. And, uh, you know, um, when I dropped to my knees and put my head in my hands, uh, you know, I just knew it was greater than me. Sometimes, you know, things have to come together. And even though you may be good at your job, even though you may be a fantastic sportsman with so many talents, you know, sometimes the stars have to align. Stars and have that, to align. <laughs> that's why you, 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 you go into these poses. That's why a lot of sportsmen, you know, do thank God and, and, and thank other people in their life. Because, as I say, you know, you don't know why it happened on that day, but it just did. And you are thankful because of that. And yeah, I mean, I guess I'm touching on that. So, so being thankful and you were saying about stars aligning, was there also someone or anything that was a real sort of influence for you or a mentor in your early days? Yeah, there was a guy called Dougie Lawton who um, signed me for, it, to, to play rugby league. You know, I, I left school. I, I tried cricket for a bit, you know, the fence and went <laughs> by the by a long time ago. I, you know, uh, a thing I have in life, I always say, you know, try and love things that love you back you know <laughs> that comes for relationships as, as, as well as <laughs> as well as sports and uh you know I always thought that um you know uh, even though rugby union was amateur when I when I played it I always knew that uh, you know I, I felt that you know if I went on to become the best rugby player that I could be that would give me something back and you know obviously I went on to to be a professional rugby league player rugby union was not professional when I uh left school and, um, you know, Doug Lawton was the guy who, who gave me the opportunity to become a uh, professional rugby player, um, you know, signing me, as I say, for witness. And uh, he, he, he was a, a big mentor of mine, someone who believed in me. Dougie wasn't the most tactical of coaches, but he was, um, 
you know, a, a great, a great philosopher. He, you know, he could connect with people. He was a great people person. And that's something I took from, um, from Dougie that sometimes we don't always know how to uh, do things, but you know, if you can connect with people and you have a passion for things, you can find and you can learn how to do things and people will teach you. And sometimes you don't know what you're capable of, you know, um, you know, if with, with passion and a, and a bit of talent, you know, you, you, it can take you a long way. And he, he was a person that, as I say, I learned a lot of, I connected with Dougie and yeah, he gave me that opportunity and you know, I took it with both hands. And then obviously when I went on to Wigan, I had a coach called John Money, who was a bit different, a far more professional, uh, you know, um, whereas Dougie would give me a pat on the back and, you know, if I scored tries, he'd be happy. Uh, John Money demanded a lot more of me. And I remember famously after the 1992, I think it was, Challenge Cup semi-final, we played uh, in Bolton and I scored five tries in that game live on, on BBC One. You know, I came off the field thinking that I was the bees and he's and uh, he said to me Martin apart from scoring those five tries uh, what else did you do and I was like what, <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought he was actually joking but he wasn't and he really challenged me and allowed me to become a better player because you didn't score five tries every game uh, though I did try <laughs> my best and that's why I, I ended up scoring 500 tries something that has never been done in the sort of the modern era and something that will never be done again because you know, I did feel at times I had the cheat code. You know, I put my physical gifts along with uh, uh, my mental gifts. And I basically, you know, saw it as, a, a, as a, you know, the fact that I wanted to get over the try line and I saw it as um, solving a problem. So I, I saw what other players could do, the likes of Valerie Hanley, the likes of Sean Edwards, who scored lots of tries but couldn't and didn't have the, the physical gifts of speed that I have. So I thought to myself, I can do what you can do. You can't do what I can do. And, you know, as I say, I, I, I took those uh, those thoughts and, uh, you know, that's what, what gave me the career that I had, literally. Yeah, yeah, literally. And in terms of your sort of personal characteristics, what have been the real things you've had to intrin intrinsically kind of lean on yourself? What's got you through the hard times that made the good times better? Uh, I think just having passion, just passion for what it is that you want to do, having passion and drive. And I say, uh, we used to have uh, this saying, we, we can find a way, make a way, you know, with desire. You don't know what, that is such a powerful tool. You do not know what you can achieve with purely desire. And we will say, you know, if you're in a burning building that you've never been in before, you don't know the way out, you don't know anything. But, you know, if you've got a desire, you know, you'll find a way to get out or you don't, you know, it's, 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 it's as simple as that. And I think that, you know, desire can take you a long way. And, I, and you know, you, you have to be passionate about, you know, it's easy to, to have desire when, you know, you, you know you're, you're passionate about something. It actually, you know, resonates with you. And, and, and rugby was that for me, it, you know, and uh, you know, as I said, literally say, it, 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 it gave me, it gave me direction for my passion, you know, you know to, 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 to play rugby league to, to and then if you want to narrow it down just to score tries you know to be on the pitch to score tries to get a great kick out of that to, you know especially when opposition of coaches and fans and supporters and and everyone was <laughs> you know apart from your own teammates you know was <laughs> against you when you went to uh, opposition grounds they didn't want you to score so you know you drew, you drew on that desire and uh, yeah you know that's that's what it was for me Okay, um, and touching on, uh, you, had a, you, you had a nickname, you have a nickname, Ch Chariots of Fire. Where, where does that come from, the nickname? Yeah, again, it was not something that I, you know, bestowed on myself. It's something that has followed me around throughout my career. I didn't realise that I was called Chariots even before I played rugby league because the first time I'd ever heard the name Chariots again was in a newspaper headline and, uh, you know, it said <laughs> Chariots of Fire. And I thought, what was that? I, mean, I never really sort of, you know... Um, related to it, uh, it was only when you know when I was doing question sport and people like Ian Botham used to start calling me chariots, and I was thinking, okay, yeah, well, whatever, <laughs> yeah. But it turns out that I was called chariots um, long before I ever went to, to rugby league. Uh, Colin Welland, who uh, wrote the screenplay to the film Chariots mm -hmm. of Fire, um, also uh, ironically wrote the, uh, the the forward to my book, <laughs> oh, okay. uh, to, to my autobiography, and, and he told me when when before he wrote it, he said, "Mine, oh, yeah, I've been a big fan of yours." Uh, and even remembered um, um, singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot when I was um, playing rugby, playing rugby union. And I don't know if you've heard about all the recent controversy surrounding the, the song Swing Low yeah. and how it was a Negro spiritual. And, you know, I didn't realise I was uh, on the pitch uh, the first time that that song was ever sung. 
during the Middlesex Sevens before I switched to rugby league back in 19... Uh, 1987, I think it was 1987, the uh, Middlesex Sevens. That was the first time it was sung, and a lot of the, uh, the documented evidence prior to that was, um, you know, it was sung in 1988 during England's um, Six Nations game with Ireland, when Crisotti, who was also a, a black uh, England winger, uh, scored a ha uh, scored a second half hat trick, I believe, against Ireland. So, yeah, I, I was. Um, I was proud to, to be associated with the song and you know, I know that with the whole Black Lives Matter thing and how you know, there's, it's a very sensitive issue at the time, but I believe that you know, we can't sponge our past, that uh, we should learn from it, not necessarily embrace the darker side of it, but learn from it. And, you know, and if you see statues or you see parts of history that uh, you know, are unsavory, then, you know, then we should, that's a, a, you know, as a, an opportunity to learn, you know, you, if you want to go back throughout history, go back to, you know, biblical times, you know, the world was not that great a place for a lot of people to live in. And, and thankfully, that is not the case now. And I know that it's not perfect. And I know what's happened with um, um, George Floyd now is, you know, as I wouldn't say it's awakened us because I think there was a general awakening now and I think that's probably more to, to do with COVID. I know I'm going off topic now. I do that. No, no, it's fine. I mean, yeah, no, I'm happy. <laughs> Q, Q, Q and A's, but um, you know, um, that is the, 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 the world that we are living and we are, we are part of yeah. that. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful to, to play a, a small part in, 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 in advancing the, you know, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the case and you know for 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 black sportsmen and, and black sportsmen in this present present era now will not experience the things that I experienced as a black man um, go, growing up in the 70s and playing sport in the 80s and you know I'm proud of the things that, that I've achieved you know and to say that you know I'm that uh, you know I'm a black man who has a statue you know in um, in London, and I, and I didn't see any statues of any black men, you know, <laughs> growing up as, as, as a black man in, in the early, um, you know, in the early um, 80s and, and 70s. Yeah, and I was going to touch on this towards the end, <clears throat> towards the end of this, but, no, but it's fine. And I think, and we, you know, are, you, are you happy to talk about some of the challenges you face when, you know? Oh, 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 more than happy because, you know, they are, they are there, they exist, I've experienced them. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard for people who are, not of my ilk maybe to to understand them and that's why sometimes there's a confusion you know when people you know say black lives matter and then people start saying it all lives matter we know all lives matter you know i am a, 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 an ambassador for a charity uh, called joining jack which um you know is promoting the, the search for a cure for duchenne you know when i go and i talk about that charity you know other people do not come to me and start telling me that all charities matter and that you know why am i not doing enough for cancer i do do things for cancer because my brother's um wife you know passed due to cancer left with him with four children to raise but you know one person cannot do everything so just because you highlight one cause does not mean that you are taken away from another cause and sometimes you know uh when people talk about black lives you know it it can get divisive and that's why i was not an advocate for for banning songs like swim so low because if you do that sometimes you know it can be divisive and there are people out there who don't want harmony don't want the advancement of black people don't want the advancement of women don't want the, the, the inclusion of um people from you know lgbtq communities they don't want these things so, and so they sit behind um you know their computers and they 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 pure at hate because in this modern world even racists don't like to be called racists they like to go by another name and stay in the, sh in the shadows now and that's why because we have come so far that even you know people with with views that you know are negative don't want to really be seen that and, and they won't come out the front and say i'm a racist and this is what i believe no they'll just be diversive and and and, and be negative and and and, and throw things and and and, and claim they are righteous when they're not being righteous. Because how can you argue against that? Like, if someone had a thing and say, gay lives matter, how am I gonna be negative towards that? If someone say, women's lives matter, how am I gonna be negative towards that? So mm. I don't see, if someone's saying black lives matter, how can you be negative towards that? It's just that sometimes there is a, a disconnect because and I, I say this sometimes, because obviously I've done a lot of, of discussions on this topic. And I say that, you know, if, if I was talking to a man who had been in prison for 40 years, about being in prison for 40 years, 
and we had a difference in opinion. And even if I was an expert on prisons, the mere fact that a man is, you know, you know, been in prison for 40 years, I, I would have to think that I would try and listen and, and try and close the gap and try and, un, and, and do my utmost to understand his situation rather than just say, oh yeah, you criminal and this and that and, and throw negative things at that person. And, and that is the hard thing. And that's why we do need education because, you know, it is because of, I don't know, upbringing. It's because of things that that person has been through. It's that things that person has been taught because no new born baby comes out of the womb and is a uh, you know a negative person it's because of the experiences and what you're taught in life and we have to educate people you know we have yeah. to you know a lot of black history I was not taught at school I you know my black history came from watching her tv show I think which came from America called Roots I'll tell you watching that in the 70s as a um, uh, as a primary school ch child I was like what what this is how we tr we treated black people back in the day I just I just really could not fathom it and I thought that was my first introduction to it I was just like you know I was flabbergasted and I don't think that should happen I think that people should be educated you know at school and in, in all areas you know the, the truth you know not just someone's version of the truth but the real truth and I think you know that we know that history is written by which tends to be the aggressors tends to be the person that are doing the harm to other people history is not uh, normally uh, written by the person who has the harm done to them yeah no no that's thank you i re really appreciate your your candid thoughts on that that was going to be the questions i asked towards the end so you've covered off uh, quite a few of those and actually i'll come back to that as well towards you if you don't mind too um so i would like to move on to um oh, well, i've got i've got another little video so a video here of um of some of your great tries i'll probably just show a minute or so of it and hopefully i'll have no yeah, we can't show the whole 500. We'll be here for a long no. time. <laughs> we might be here sometime. <laughs> <laughs> These are the greatest ever, but I'll show the first minute, but just a really yeah. good example of, uh, yeah, of your illustrious sporting career. going to pause it there far from all of them but um, man you're fast <laughs> yes i did have speed on my side um <laughs> thankful my um apparently i think i've got my dad to thank for that he um was a uh, quite a keen sprinter apparently back in nigeria uh in his youth um but went into law and became a lawyer so you know you, 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 it doesn't you know start with you but obviously i um trained very hard and uh, yeah you know looking back at some of that old grainy footage i'm thankful that uh, we do have youtube so i do yeah i do uh, like uh, you know when i tell my kids i scored 10 tries in a game or i did this or i did that and they're like you've got the proof to back it up i didn't Dad. It's, yeah. it's nice to have the proof even though it is a Absolutely. little bit grainy but it uh yeah it, it's nice to to look on, back on it and um yeah to uh, when you know now i've got my um, foot in a, in a plaster cast and you know I wish I could I, I could run that fast but yeah absolutely <laughs> I don't think I'll ever travel that fast over my own propulsion ever again <laughs> I'm gonna now move on to life after sports so I touch on the fact that uh, you're now Martin Afire MBE so you won your Queen's Award you, you got potential Queen's Award back in 1997 yeah I got to I got um, it was a, a fantastic day the day I got um, my um mb i just remember i think we had a rugby match i was playing for london broncos at the time richard branson um owned london broncos at that time and i think i had training in the morning and then i had to get a, a taxi to go and pick up 
my uh, award and then uh, I had to get on a motorbike taxi, a vir virgin used to have these <laughs> motorbike taxis, to a helicopter to get up to Warrington to play wow. a game, to play a game on the Friday. I played a game on the Friday, I think for London against Warrington. And then on the Saturday, I played um, for, for Bedford against Rotherham. So I, th that was the time I was playing rugby. I was playing for a rugby union team and a rugby league team at the same time and got my MBE. So that was, uh, that was a fantastic weekend, which I, um, I, I think I talk about in my autobiography, which also yeah. came out in uh, 1997. No, it's an amazing achievement. And then, yeah, the, well, the pictures here depict various things, but moving on from rugby and, uh, and into, into ballroom dancing. So were you, you were one of the first really come dancing yeah. uh, uh, um, competitors, I, I believe? Yeah, I was the first ever contestant number one. First ever. Oh, you number one. To, oh, to amazing. To dance on, on Strictly. I was in the first series of Strictly. That's myself and Erin Bow doing the waltz there. So the, I think that must have been the, the opening night of uh, Strictly. Uh, uh, even to this day, when I hear the, um, um, the, the announcer saying, and dance in the waltz, and that music starts, to, I, my stomach goes. Because, uh, yeah, when you're dancing live on BBC One on a Saturday night on a major <laughs> reality TV show, the nerves, I'll tell you, it is beyond belief. And when it's something that you've, it's not your chosen discipline. And I've been only sort of um, uh, rehearsing for a couple of weeks. And then you have to go out there and perform the waltz and all the steps. And you're just, I just thought I, my mind went blank for a moment. And I just couldn't, I thought to myself, God, and everyone was like, just calm down. I'm like, just calm down. You'll be, if you've rehearsed, you've done it. And thankfully, it um, uh, went all right, I think. <laughs> I, I still probably didn't do that well. Uh, Craig Rick over Hallwood was my nemesis. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's always mean. He's always mean. He was mean. always talking about my bum sticking out and this. <laughs> but I went on to, I think I got it to the, the semi final. It was only one show that I didn't do. I think I got went out in the quarter final, I think, yeah. So it was only one show that I didn't do. Um, yeah, and it spurred me on to a host of reality TV shows. I think England winning the World Cup in 2003 um, was, uh, helped me get on the show. I think, yeah, it was 2004, first series I did mm. on Strictly. So yeah, that, that was um, fantastic. You know, I'd, I'd been trying to get into acting. I'd, I'd, I'd played myself in a few uh, soaps like uh, Hollyoaks and Emmerdale and, um, you know, done a few other things. But um, um, that was my first sort of major foray into reality TV. I'd done a, a few things before, but, um, uh, like question of sport and a few other shows, but um, yeah, to, to appear on Strictly was was massive for me. And you know, subsequently, I've appeared on a host of reality TV shows. Some with Virginia, my wife, who you know well, uh, she just so wanted to be on Mr. and Mrs. And um, I remember <laughs> we got to the final, and it was probably because of a silly mistake that I made. Uh, and she never lets me forget that, <laughs> that we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't win Mr. and Mrs. Uh, also appeared on Big Star, <laughs> Big Star's Little Star with uh, my oldest son, Tyler, who revealed to the world some very personal information about me, which I, I, I won't remember. <laughs> well, I do remember, but I'm not going <laughs> to tell it here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you leave, leave yourself bare on reality TV. Uh, I think the most recent biggest show I've done was um, Celebrity Hunted last year <laughs> with Gavin Henson yeah. and uh, yeah that was uh, that was very traumatic and again I embarrassed myself in front of the nation and she's like <laughs> why, why did I have to put you peeing on TV I was like oh god and uh, being hunted and running through um, st stinging nettle bushes without with only my underpants don't ask me how I ended up in that situation but sometimes when the hunters are after you you just have to run you have to go uh, yeah so you can still catch that I think on all four at the moment so uh, yeah had the old reality tv um throughout uh, my years um appearing on shows such as splash and come dine with me uh the weakest link uh too many to mention <laughs> and there now I've um uh, evolved and I'm in the sustainability world and I've got a serious job and invested in a company called Connected Curb. Yeah I was going to ask you about that your brand ambassador for Connected Curb tell us a bit about that. Yeah well um, I've been getting into EVs um, for a few years now I think uh, you know if she's, I think it was around about 2016 uh, another rugby player a World Cup winner as well Andy Gomesall gave me a lift in his i3 
And I thought, what's this? It's trem tremendous um, torque. I don't know if anyone who, who's driven an EV knows the, the tremendous acceleration that all EVs have because you get, you know, the, it's a direct uh, from the battery to the motor. It's direct power, direct torque, they call it. And so it's instant acceler acceleration, like being on a fairground ride. And so, you know, that's stuck in the back of, back of my mind. And I think in 2017, my wife, Virginia, uh, had an accident in her car. So I ended up getting her an i3, which is fantastic. And, you know, um, you know, the savings that you have, not only saving the planet, but, you, you know, it, EVs are so much cheaper to run once you buy them. We, we bought a, a second-hand i3, and it was fantastic. And I used to drive it all the time because um, I had a, uh, I had a gas-guzzling uh, Range Rover and uh, Range Rover Sport, and I, and I used to drive Ginny's... <laughs> I three because I, I didn't want to you know pay a hundred pounds to, <laughs> to a tank of diesel <laughs> to a tank of diesel where it cost two pounds to uh, you know in electricity to fuel an I three which was fantastic but then we decided to do a trip in the I three to Bath and then you know because I've got a, a driveway I can charge my the I three up overnight every morning you have a full tank of electricity so unless you are, I, we went beyond the range of the i3 you know then we had no problems when we go beyond the i3 and we have to use what is known as arterial charging then that is when <laughs> you know range anxiety and all the negatives come around you know the charging infrastructure around e electric vehicles so i thought to myself you know what else could i do so i heard about these things called teslas so i, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a tesla not a brand new one because they are extremely expensive which can you know limit um you know the transition to ev so i decided to buy a used uh tesla so which i did and uh you know with the, with the with the you know, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure network that Tesla have, I was able to drive, you know, anywhere in the country, you know, with ease. I could, we, we had a family trip all the way to the south of France. And so when uh, I thought to myself, you know, this infrastructure play, this is, this is the difference. This is a difference maker. You know, if, if, if we can have uh, as much infrastructure all around the country that, that I have now with my, with my charger on my, uh, you know, my home drive and, uh, you know, the infrastructure all around, you know, Europe that Tesla has with its supercharger network, you know, it's a no brainer. So when a, a friend of mine approached me to invest and, be, and uh, get involved in Connected Curb, who um, provide charging infrastructure, you know, for people without driveways, uh, you know, because I had the driveway. If you didn't have a driveway, then you couldn't get the charging infrastructure on, you know, outside your house and, uh, you because the, the government weren't putting uh, charging infrastructure, you know, on street uh, for people and the, the charging infrastructure that, that was on street were these big cylinders that they used to have and people are like, I don't want one of those outside my house, but Connected Curb Solution was very innovative. You know, we had put the, the, the charge uh, underground and then all we do is enable existing street furniture so you don't have the clutter. Uh, on the streets, uh, you know, it's connected to to power and data as well. So we can do lots of other things. It's basically like having, you know, Alexa at the driveway in on your drive. So we can do a host of things with IOTs. You know, we can do, uh, you know, air quality monitoring. We can do parking sensors. We can do so many things, and you know, and everything. Most of the the, the computing, the edge computing, is underground. So, the, you know, that's that last picture is one of my shots for our website, which Virginia actually took. My wife is a, a photographer, took that, that picture. And so that's how I got involved uh, with Connected Curb. And I do a lot of talks now uh, spreading the word for, um, for, for the transition to EV. And, um, yeah, I connect with a lot of sporting clubs, obviously with my sporting background, with a lot of local authorities renewable energy companies and power companies and basically just trying to get this infrastructure out there so mm -hmm. everyone can have the ease and convenience that I have. You know, I have a driveway. I have, I'm fortunate enough to have a charger at the gym. I'm fortunate enough to have superchargers around me. So it, it's an easy, it's easy for me. It's convenient, but for people who live in flats and apartments or in uh, terrace houses or houses without driveways, then they find it a lot more difficult to, uh, to, to have an EV. And I know that I'm what's known as an early adopter because I, I did the transition to EV, you know, long ago. We have two EVs now at home, as I said. Um, you know, I'll never drive uh, an ICE vehicle again. The government have obviously announced that they will um, ban fossil fuel cars, ICE cars, you know, from 2035. It was 2040. You know, it could, mm, uh, you know, could well be sooner. Could well be sooner, so we need to get that infrastructure out there. And you know, I'm doing a lot of work with uh, local authorities 
uh, up in my uh, heartland of um, um, uh, you know the northwest where I played rugby, and also in in in, uh, in boroughs that I'm living in, like Ealing and Hackney, and uh, and Lewisham, and, and as I say, a lot of the, the, the surrounding boroughs in, in London. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, lockdown. So you know, we've all just you know, COVID hit the hit the world. It's been a it's been a very tough month for quite a, quite a lot of us in different capacities. I just wanted to know a bit about how I guess you've kept yourself sane, happy, busy during lockdown. What have been your uh, experiences over the last? Yeah, month? Um, uh, my experience over the last month. You know, I like I'm a positive person. I'm a people person. I try and see the positive in any situation. Um, you know, it's a very negative uh, situation for a lot of people I know. And, and for me, being a landlord and, and working now, I'm, I'm working from home. So now, now I love working from home. Um, you know, you can see from the background that my wife, Virginia, is like, you know, that is just not by um, chance that all those things behind me are in that, those positions. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have uh, decorated the house, <laughs> the whole downstairs as... Uh, been decorated you know our, our, our garden has is, is changed uh, I do a lot of DJing as you well know Shona so I have been uh, doing my lockdown DJ sessions which have kept me sane at the weekends and yes and just to try to make the best out of, of the situation that we're in and uh, you know try and spread love and, and positivity really. Um, and and um, and what about I guess learning about yourself? I think lockdown's been an unusual time for everybody, spending so much time just either on our own or with our families. What have you learned about yourself during this time? Anything that surprised you? Um, I, I've learned that I uh, I do love working from home. I, I thought that that wouldn't be something for me. That you know the lines would be too blurred and and uh, you know just just what you know I just like to you know that, that's work and you know this is uh, this is this is home and you know would would I be able to be productive in that environment but I've, I've found out that I can be productive that um, you know you can find yourself in a situation and um, you, you know you you have to be open that's what you know it's good to be open to any situation that you, you if you go into anything with closed mind the chances are it won't work but you know these are things that people often hear these messages don't you and you like you just you know they wash over you so messages and, and then sometimes for for whatever reason, things just resonate. And that's something I've learned about myself, that sometimes you have to be still and allow things to resonate. And, uh, you know, you know to, 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 I've always been open, been an open person, but then sometimes, you know, like you, you kind of do things and then, you know, when you, you get time to, to pause, and that's something I've learned that sometimes you do need time to, to, to be still. And I think that's what um, COVID has taught the world really some i think and that is that sometimes you know because we've had to we've been forced to be still we've always been rushing around trying to get so many things done and whatever and it's, it allows allowed us that time to just to take stock to find out what is really truly important in our lives you know like that like people are losing their lives around us and we are constantly trying to advance and, and get somewhere and then you know we've taken that time to just calm be calm know that you know i think we've actually had covid i think um Ollie and Kelly came around our house with a, a COVID test kit for Virginia. She took it. And even though we haven't got COVID now, she had the antibodies. And, you know, if we're living in the same house with her, it's chances are that we've had it as well. And, you know, we're, we're thankful that we've come through it. We are alive. We are able to take on challenges that, you know, because sometimes in life you think that, oh, it's a negative that I've got all these things that are going wrong, like me now with my foot. Now I'm just thankful that I'm alive and I've got, you know, a bad foot and I'm able to learn about turmeric and how that affects the inflammation in the body. And, you know, so I'm on that kind of journey and I'm going to, you know, I've got my turmeric shots, which, you know, thankfully, you know, the turmeric company who I'm thankful for them for sending it to me, but now I'm going to learn how to make turmeric paste and, you know, from organic mm. turmeric and, and all these other things. And, and, you know, so, you know, you do, you can see the positive things and, and yeah. life is, is a journey and, and we should just be thankful that we are hard here experiencing those things, be they good or bad, bad good mindset. And, uh, you know, and I think that's something I've learned, you know, through, um, through uh, being through this time. I think that, we we don't also learn as individuals i think we are learning as as a, as a nation you know sitting listening yeah. to to boris's um updates and you know and, and going out and just like uh you know breathing clean air because of the lack of um you know uh, transport 
that's been happening and the journeys, uh, you know, I think the transport daily journeys have been reduced by over 90%, you know, and, and in, in urban areas where we're, we're breathing clean air, which hasn't been done for yeah. um, so, so many years. And that, you know, when at the end of this year, the figures that, that will be released at the end of this year, I'm sure of the number of people who will die due to air pollution. I think it's around 40,000 people a year, a year, I think, die in the UK because of uh, air pollution. And I think that figure is going to be so reduced this year. And when we see that figure being, um, uh, being put out, that we're going to have to say, you know, we're going to have to do more to keep those figures down. And that, uh, you know, is, 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 that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's good, as you say, taking the positive out of circumstances allows us all to continue to grow. And, you know, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a difficult, challenging you know, time for everybody, I think. Um, I'm moving on to the last bit of the question. And actually, we touched on it already, Martin. So I think um, in regards to... Oh, excuse me. Why is it working? Yeah, um, well, yeah talking to, a bit about diversity in sport, you thankfully covered off with regards to the, 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 the Swing Low Sweet Chariot song. That was going to be one of the things I wanted to ask you. But I think really what I, I guess would be interesting for us to know is what do you what do you feel are the challenges facing young black women and men in sports today? And what advice would you give them um, if you could? Um, I think the, the, the challenges for a lot of um, um, black sportsmen and women, um, I think equate to the next level. Uh, you know, there are tremendous examples of, you know, black sportsmen in, in many fields that have done great things, you know, from Mo Farah to, you know, going back further, people like John Barnes in, in football, um, Jason Robinson, you know, uh, uh, and so many, Maggie Alfonsi, you know, uh, who ironically is, is, is one of the, not one of the, is the only, um, woman uh, or man from an ethnic background who's on the RFU committee and there are 55 members on that committee and um, you know that's where where the next challenge is it's beyond the pitch you know there's there's countless examples of, of black sportsmen and women who have appeared you know for in, in professional teams and and for national teams on the pitch but it's that next level how many you know um, um, black and ethnic um, you know, marketing officers are there, you know, managers, uh, commercial directors. Um, why, are the, why are we not filtrating to other areas? You know, are there ceilings? Uh, are there uh, barriers, invisible? You know, we're not, not necessarily saying because they, 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 for racist reasons. Are they, is it just because of other things like cultural factors? You know, like someone asked me once, you know, why am I not a, a coach? And I said, maybe, maybe if uh, you know, I had a, a history in the game, maybe if I had a father or I had a grandfather's cousins, uh, uncles who were in the game, maybe then my, my ties to the game might have been stronger. Uh, maybe it could be because of intergenerational wealth. You know, if you want to go back in, in, in history and you know, go back to, to our darkest times, if you, you, know, you follow the, the, as they say, follow the money back through generation, you know, in, in the UK, if you go back far enough, you're probably going to come to slavery at some point. If that, if, you know, uh, if you keep going, if you keep following that, that money and it keeps going back, you know, otherwise it could be the industrial evolution or, or other factors. So it's not necessarily always race. It is, is other cultural factors, as I say, that affect why, uh, you know, there are not many black people, maybe owners, because, you know, uh, that comes from normally intergenerational wealth. It's not normally people who get get rich and then didn't do something. It's normally, you know, because my grandfather, my great grandfather, you know, owned a football club, and he, you know, and his great great, you know, and that's another factor why it has. It's just just discussion, education, learning, having conversations, being able to dig deep, having honest conversations, so a lot more people know a lot more things about our current situation. And I think that is what we have to have sometimes have conversations which at times i think were uncomfortable for a lot of people and, and yeah. people were very sensitive about that because especially if people were in those situations though you know maybe people thought maybe the money was going to be taken off them or, or or whatever you know because if a lot of people may not know that when slavery was abolished you know that everyone who owned slaves was compensated for those slaves you know and that money is probably still uh, uh in society today you know many church of england um uh uh you know priests 
and uh, you know it was just like this, it was like the stock market people now i did not know these things a few years ago i'm just learning about these things that um it was like you know owning slaves like owning shares and they were handed down you know to to, to widows you know who would have been destitute if in suddenly when slavery was ended that um you know they weren't compensated for uh, for the slaves that were, were you know were, were freed that uh, many people in this country would have fallen wealthy people would have then become you know paupers in the street because they would have instantly had no wealth because all they had were the slaves that they were left by you know grandparents or or parents or husbands or whatever you know and, and, and <laughs> probably get a delivery there i have got the worst, worst bell in the world but i love it real life <laughs> This is, that is real. Some bell. <laughs> that is some bell. And the worst is, but I keep trying to change that. Oh, yeah, I think it's a, a delivery. It's for, you. It's for me. <laughs> uh, I've been told. Uh, uh, my train of thought. But you know, it's just like discovering things, things like that. It, it, that is his, that is great historical knowledge. Why is that not taught in school? There's no school in the country that I know of that is teaching people that things. I certainly didn't learn that at school, and I believe that that is what we need to do we need to educate ourselves and we need to yeah. know things from a, a young age and not in a, a negative way but in a positive way you know this is the past you know I'm not saying it has to be embraced but you know just that is you know it is it is yeah. what we've lived through you know we have to be honest and, and candid about it and sometimes i don't th feel that um we are able to do that no, uh, yeah, thank you. No, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Um, we've probably got a few minutes left and uh, we've had a couple of questions come up on the chat screen. Um, but I think now I'll pass the floor over to anyone that might have questions um, out there in the audience. If I unmute, um, or you can, I think everyone can unmute themselves or I can unmute everybody. And if anybody would like to ask any questions, please, please fire away. Hi, Martin. This is Liam. Thank you so much for making time for us today. This has been a brilliant, well, I feel like I've been part of the conversation. It's just you, you and Shona talking, but it's been brilliant to, uh, to sit on the sidelines and listen. I, I want to go back to that, that, that point you made about, uh, and I loved how you described the conversation around Black Lives Matter. And even this morning, me and a few other people on the school were talking about how to educate people, you know, that are saying things like, oh, well, you know, all lives matter. And really how people are not getting it and not not fully understanding that the conversation and i wonder you know we're having those conversations at richemont we're talking a, a lot about how do we continue to make more and more people feel included in our community you know richemont is thirty-seven thousand people worldwide um and all corporations not just us all companies have a long way to go to really you know make everyone feel included and I just wondered if there's any experiences you have from either the business world that you're in now uh, or clubs that you've played at or where you've either had wonderful or terrible experiences um, in the way you were made to feel like you either belonged or didn't belong and what those differences were like, what, what, what the difference between a good and a bad experience might be. Um, uh, that's a great that's a great question so many parts to it <laughs> I, I tried to write some down Sorry. I, I lost Sorry. my train of thought but I'll, I'll try and, and, and speak and, and cover a few things on one point I would say as my message to corporations as, as I, I was speaking to the RFU uh, marketing team not too long ago and I said that um, even though I do know that it wasn't you know it wasn't black people who ended slavery it, it, it took white people to end slavery but sometimes when things when things if you feel are not changing then you need to look in the room that you are in and if you are in a room that is built on merit on a meritocracy and there is only one type of person in that room then you need to ask questions because even in the mba which is a sport which is meant to be supposedly predominantly um for tall athletic black men there are still people from all races in that team who find them in find their way in on why based on merit even when something is predominantly meant for a certain type of pe person other people find their way in so if you're sitting in a room and there's only one type of person in that room you know be that um white males or whatever then you have to not say that is 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 
is should be is should be called in question and be called racist. But then you definitely have to ask yourself a question: Is there a barrier to entry? That would be my message to um, um, to to organisations, and that is you have to have decision makers from different backgrounds. You know, like uh, I was talking to a friend of mine recently who owns a um, uh, sports marketing uh, company, and they wanted to to um, to Im improve their inclusiveness because they, you know, that they, they were no way racist or whatever. But it was they, it was a little bit of a of a boys' club. They were talking about sport, and sometimes, you know, that that would not uh, on purpose, but it would still include people. But I said, what you need to do, you have to have different people in that room because if you have different people in that room, then everyone is going to be catered for when decisions are made, or or simple things, or even conversations are had, or the decision to what place to go and have the the staff drinks that month or just little things which you might take take for granted or you know what i mean or, or or less kind of jokes are going to be made about one type of person if there's more of that person in the room does that make sense absolutely yeah no absolutely um that, that's what, what i what i would say but coming on to personal experiences that you know be as uh, you know the, these can be very personal in in the sense that um uh you know some people might take something else and deem it as a negative and i might take that same action and deem it as a positive uh, and the funny thing that i uh, and I, I i say it's funny it's not really funny and that is that when i was uh, starting playing rugby and i was scoring a lot of tries and I was taking a lot of negativity from the crowd. I so turned that negativity into a positivity that even to this day, I miss it. And people say that is the weirdest thing that I miss be, I miss the, the, the you know, be, literally being in that environment when, you know, I'm, there's, there's, there's 20,000 people in the stadium. I'm, uh, you know, there's, I'm, we are, my, the team I'm playing for is one try down and I'm being abu racially abused by so many opposition fans. And I'm thinking, I so want to score today. I so want to score today. And that exhilarating feeling when I got over the line and I stood there, puffed my chest out, and there is like a whole crowd of people baying, wanting me to die and that is a you know even when i'm talking about it now i can feel <laughs> my heart beating and the hair standing up the back of my neck and i think to myself that is such and i think to myself sometimes that is sad that i actually miss being in an environment where i'm being racially abused because it's an electric environment and i know that if i'm going to score that i'm going to and that's what these those 500 tries that shona talked about <laughs> earlier on that's what it was it was it was that desire to to score uh, you don't know how exhilarating a feeling that is it's like almost being in what it must be in the the uh, not quite the same because i'm not going to die i won't go that far but it being in the amphitheaters of rome and those who are about to die salute you i'm sure if you spoke to some of them gladiators that got through that process and and then went into retirement and had so much money and lived a great life in togas they probably missed that intensity you know fighting lions or whatever and i miss those environments but then there might have been a, another black man of a different um mental disposition as myself could have crumbled and could have been sat here telling you a totally different story about his experience about how he didn't feel, you know he cried after being off that off that field uh because you know and he, he couldn't compete because that was a negative Thing. And that's why I believe that there are certain humans in this world who, you know, who survive no matter what the, the, the situation they're in. You know, like you know, certain people had to live through slavery. Certain people had to live through, um, you know, the suffragette movement. Certain people had to live through negative things, periods in their life. You know, certain people have to live through uh, bereavement. You know, relationship losses. So many things, and they have to find their way through it and come out the other side and seek help. And you know, I I, I lived through that negative, you know. Uh, part of my life and I do to this day when I'm sitting here at home with my boot on and I'm watching some of the tries that I that Shona showed and I think to myself I remember a certain time I remember that thing thinking you know when I thought about that that negative experience I had when Alex Murphy wrote that story in the paper about me and I thought if I was white would he have written that you know or I questioned things if I was white would they have done that and I think if I dwelled on that too much, then maybe I wouldn't have an MB, maybe I wouldn't have 
you know, be people coming up to me in the streets this day saying, oh, I remember that try that you scored, or people who still message me on, on social media now apologizing. I still get people from Hull and from places that I went apologizing because of, they have grown as people as well, apologizing for abusing me. And I think that's so funny. <laughs> But then, as I say, I still do, in a perverse way, miss it. And I, that, should, that sounds strange because I wouldn't want my, my sons, Phoenix or Tyler, to, to, to have to go through that. But, you know, I did live through that. And um, I'm not saying I'm thankful. But then if I didn't, would I have been as successful? I don't know. So Would you have pushed yourself so hard? Would you have been so driven? It's hard to say, I suppose. It, 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 it's, it's, it's very hard to say. But, yeah, I do kind of, like, sometimes, like, miss that. Because that, as I say, I can't, I can't explain too highly how such a, a charged environment that is that and you know and and even though I'm trying to explain it to you I can't I can't do it justice if I'm honest and so that's why when people who talk against Black Lives Matter and talk about that how can if they haven't experienced that how can they you know how it's, it's just hard to, to to bridge that gap and no matter how enthusiastic and how passionate I am about it it's hard for someone to experience and if I put that person in that same environment that I was in and and they were black and they experienced that and lived that they would see things differently and I think it's trying to communicate that experience and if I can communicate that experience well enough to somebody and it gravitates with them that's when you you cannot but get advancement. Thank Brilliant. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was really powerful. You gave me goosebumps as well. Um, is there any, any other questions from anybody out there before before we sign off? I think we've run a little bit over. I, Andy's oh. desperate for a question. <laughs> I can tell Andrew. Andrew's been waiting for. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh yeah, no, it's just going to say. It's just going to say. Can you hear me, there, Shona? Hi. Yeah, Hi. I can hear you. Hey, how you doing? And Martin, just, I mean, first of all, just thanks, you know, thanks a lot for your time today. I really, really appreciate listening to your story. And um, I just want to say, obviously, I was, um, I grew up in St. Helens, so I was kind of a... Oh, like, God! Yeah, so I was... Uh, I'm you know, the most basically. popular person in St. Helens. Yeah, yeah, so when, when, yeah. I saw this pop, when I saw this pop up in the, in the bar a week or so ago, I've, I've, I've got to attend, I've, I've got to... Play. Uh -oh. you know, I, was, I was like a season ticket holder at Saints, you know, all, all my growing my kind of young life, and obviously I've watched, I've watched all, your, all your career and all your tries. I definitely, definitely didn't boo you, you know, so, <laughs> one of those fans um it was it's really good seeing the videos there on youtube as you say I've, I've, I've kind of watched a lot of that over the last over the last few months i think i even went to the game against canberra at old trafford that I think oh, yeah. the tries i went there yeah. uh, years ago witnesses greatest ever evening <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and it was i mean one of the things that struck me is more of a sporting question about rugby league actually is you know, when you look back at the old games, I just feel like the game was so open and it just felt like there was a lot more flair in the game. And when you compare it to the modern game, it's a lot more sort of physical and, and structured. I don't know about your thoughts about how, you know, rugby league today and the sport as it is now versus what it was in the past, just from a, a game perspective. Yeah, I think, um, you know, everything evolves, doesn't it? Um, nothing stays the same. And then, you know, if I as a player start, you know, having that uh, point of view that people say, oh, you know, he's just a Luddite, you know, go away. Um, in my, you know, that's why, you know, with the old men, he's going, in my day, <laughs> those, those stories that start off with in my day, so, sometimes it always has a, a negative connot connotation. But yeah, I do understand where you're coming from. It was a different time. Um, you know, there's a history of rugby union players, you know, uh, you know especially rugby union backs who came and played um, um, rugby league. Uh, you know, obviously the likes of Tom Van Bollenhoven, who was, uh, you know, a, a great <laughs> bench uh, legend. Uh, also Billy Boston, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the yeah, other two. Yeah, you know, Jonathan Davis as well. Was, was oh, yeah, Jonathan Davis. He was a fantastic player to play. Probably the last crown prince of, of fly halves to come from mm -hmm. Wales and, and mm -hmm. someone who, who I, I consider a, a true friend to this day. And I'll tell you a funny story surrounding Jonathan, and that was the, the day that to me and Jonathan had history in the sense that I played against Jonathan when I was playing rugby union. Uh, I was just a literally nobody, and he was a big superstar, the Welsh fly half, and we were playing in, down in Aber Iron Sevens, and um, uh, I think I scored a, a, a loads of tries basically, and should have won the, the man of the tournament, and and Jonathan won it, and to this day I always like rig him about it, and I did a podcast mm -hmm. with him. I said, "You still remember that you won the you won the man of the match, and that?" And he's like, "Martin, let it go, let it go." It was mm -hmm. 1987. 
when he came to to play with me at Witness, he's a fantastic player. He, he's someone who had a, a lot of stick, and they always thought he was too small and wouldn't be able to to you know be big enough or, or queued up enough to play the game. And he was you know arguably one of the you know along with Jason Robertson probably and, and Sonny mm. B. Williams, the greatest cr- cross code. Um, rugby players of all time, you know, so fantastic in the sport. You know, I manufactured my side step, but that guy was like Phil Bennett. He could step off both feet. You know, one of those people when you think, God, how is this guy so talented? You know, and uh, it's, it's funny how you look at other people's talents and you know, <laughs> and then you degrade your own talents. But he was a, a fantastic player, and you know, the, yeah, you you're great. You know, players like Harry Pinner, you know, and uh, yeah. and, and Doug Law, and was so creative. But, you know, to, to be effective now, but, you know, and, and is, sport is about winning now, so much so, you know, I'm sure it was about winning back then, but, you know, and so people just finding the most effective ways to, to win, aren't they? So, you know, if there's a better way to, to win, which is less creative, then, you know, what are you going to do? You, you, you're going to be, um, are you going to be, uh, be more creative and lose or be, or me, be more effective and win? Uh, but you know there are still modern greats, you know, the likes of you know Jonathan Thurston, and, and you know, so there are still creative players in the game today, and you know, those are the kind of players that you know I, I love to watch. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks a lot. Anybody else um, want to ask a question before we finish up? Let's see if there's anyone on the on the chat. Um, oh. I've got some here, there's one second. Oh no, uh, Liam's already asked that. You were asked earlier by Aoife, who I think might still be on the call. She was asking how you felt during that moment when you were inducted to the Rugby Hall of Fame. You watched that video earlier, Martin. What were the emotions going through your, through your mind? Um, yes, uh, yeah, it was just harking back to, um, you know, you, well, you're never gonna, um, you're never gonna recreate, um, you know, scoring a length of the field try at Wembley or playing at Twickenham and, you know, skipping around lots of people or just, you know, winning, lifting the trophy, a meaningful trophy. You're never going to experience those emotions again. So when you retire as a sportsman, you are definitely, even if you don't do it consciously, you are literally searching for, for experiences to try and feel that it is, well, I'm not saying it is like a drug, it is a drug. Yeah, and uh, when you experience those the highs and sometimes, you know, you have the lows when you retire and that's why sportsmen often descend into relationship breakups, you know, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, because, you know, consciously or unconsciously, your body still needs that. And, you know, when you do get those accolades, it's a time to reminisce and feel those emotions again, you know, just to, to walk onto the field as I did with my sons, uh, to, to be heralded and to be cheered and, and booed, <laughs> uh, to say, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, to, to feel those and, and to, to, to in some way feel those emotions is probably the reason why I DJ as well. You know, when you put a good tune on and everyone, you know, uh, reacts positively to it, you know, when I put Dina Vass on, waiting for you, you know, it's again to, 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 to feel those emotions, to feel alive, to feel joy, to feel intense, yes. certain thing that we are all as human beings searching for that thing. And, and um, sometimes it's hard, you know, in life when you don't have those things. And that's why, you know, people have that, whether it's their holiday to look forward to, whether it's a promotion. And I remember back to driving, passing my driving test, I felt those emotions. So I think, I, true in life we do need those little highs and if yeah. life does become mundane whether it's relationships you know i don't want to get into two things <laughs> but uh, you know but we're just talking about the human existence and and i get down to the core of it you know because we as sportsmen are no different to other human beings you know who don't we're just fortunate that we get to experience those kind of immense highs after immense workload you know what i mean but it's the same as in business you know when you clinch a deal now I know I am, I'm feeling that feeling now where you get that email and suddenly all that hard work you've been putting in for months and then suddenly someone's agreed to that deal and you can punch the air and go, yes, fantastic. You know, or you do it, you do a, a great job and, you know, and your, your, your manager gives you, you know, you know, you get an award. So you do need those things in life, those incentives. Yeah, you do need to stick, you need to do the hard work. But in life, it is about feeling those things and at that yeah. moment in time on the pitch. Yeah, I did feel like, you know, it's sad some ways because you know it's over, but then it's still, you still for a moment, you know, who doesn't like to be, to walk onto a course, pitch in front yeah. of 20,000 people and be applauded for stuff that you've done 10, 10 years ago, you know? 
I'd, I'd like it if Ginny would applaud me for, you know, the cleaning up that I did two weeks ago. Probably not going to happen. I'll put, I'll put in a good word. Yeah, <laughs> well, good. yeah, I think we, we, we all, thought, we all as human beings need certain things. And I think sportsmen are fortunate enough because you, 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 uh, you get that admiration and, you know, from, from, from many people. But then when you retire and you fade out, then it's hard to replace that. But, you know, yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay, well, that I think is going to draw an end to, to today's talk. But, Martin, on behalf of Richemont and our Keep Connected sessions, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and my thank pleasure. You. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, bye. Yeah, but thank you thank so, you. so much. Thank you. thank you very much. Wishing you a speedy recovery with your foot, and, uh, and I'll touch base with you soon. Okay, thanks. So thanks, Joe. Bye. 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 Thank you so much.